Good afternoon and welcome to today's podcast brought to you by Equine Devil's Advocate. My goodness, it is a Friday already and of course we hope you have all had a very good week. Now, Friday is of course a follow-up and correspondence day um, where we get to listen to your correspondence from Monday's question, which was about a sort of personal relationship and thoughts, overview of thoughts on thoroughbred horses. And of course, there will be further adventures of Dennis the Menace. So, without further ado, let's have a look and see what came in this Friday. This one said, Red Ram for me. In my early teens, the only posters on my bedroom walls were Red Ram and Stroller, two wonderful horses that stole my heart. I loved to watch Red Ram race, as he always gave his all, and you could see he absolutely loved his job. His story is amazing. And I also had the pleasure of competing a lovely Big Bay X Point to Pointer called Major Score. Such a gentleman in every way, as I could pop him in the trailer and take him off to dressage competitions and he would always come home with a rosette and more often than not win the class. He was so enjoyable as he really seemed to love the job he was doing. Such lovely memories. Then on the flip side of that, from the hot stuff camp, we had somebody who said, Thoroughbreds are so temperamental. I took my thoroughbred to a cross-country show, thinking he was going to be so well-behaved. How wrong I can be. We started well, but part of the course went down a valley, and all of the spectators were standing at the top. Instead of jumping the jump, he decided to plough his way through the crowds at top speed. You've never seen people move so fast as I actually couldn't stop. Needless to say, we didn't do cross-country again after that. And here's another one from the Hot Stuff Camp. Thoroughbreds scare me. I own one, but they are so different to cobs and require a different approach, shall we say. I have also seen how fast she gallops in the field, so I'm not particularly looking forward to taking her into an open space. And then we had another one. Again, it's a slightly different theme. This person says, I get the blood brain thing. My horse is Dutch, KWPN, in passport. But in blood, he is the grandson of an Argentinian thoroughbred. It astounds me how quick his mind is. And I'm learning how to keep up and about how my best skill with him is actually my own mental focus. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. Thank you for that one. And then we had another one from a lady who says, I went to see a horse that was being sold out of training with and for my husband. When we were walking across the yard, a bucket flew through the air and landed at our feet. I looked to see where it had come from, and there was a little thoroughbred horse staring at us over his stable door. We looked at the original horse that we had come to see and decided it were not suitable for my husband. As we left, I couldn't help but notice the bucket-throwing horse still staring at us. And so I inquired, what about that one? The trainer said, no, that one's no good. But I couldn't get him out of my head. Every day I thought about him and so decided to go back and try again to buy him. I took with me a very knowledgeable friend to also look at him. His appraisal was, well, I can't actually find anything wrong with it, but I wouldn't recommend buying it. It's not very pretty to look at. Yet something compelled me. So I went ahead and bought him. And to this day, my husband would say that was the best horse he had ever had. And this is another one from a lady that says, When my daughters were 11 and 12, I purchased their first horses, a thoroughbred mare and an Arab gelding. I was stark raving bonkers, was the overall opinion of all and sundry. 
Yes, that bonkers moment has been a roller coaster journey without question. Our thoroughbred was very special. She definitely had a talent for acting. Within two weeks, she had her first colic attack, going on to have 17 more in the following five years. Every conceivable trigger caused her to lie flat out on her stable floor. She would look at us, groan, and look at her stomach, and then look at us again to make sure that we understood her pain. She liked us then to sit on the stable floor so that she could put her head in our lap, stroke her cheek, and shush her. Do not try this at home. Finally, we came to the conclusion after numerous veterinary tests, either she was infatuated with the vet or had a drug addiction. On many occasions after the vet had administered the necessary medication, she would cuddle into his chest and then look up at him lovingly, even sometimes jump up as he came into her stable, stomach pain seemingly forgotten. Hmm. Many, many wonderful, funny antics I could continue with. Our thoroughbred, she was as honest, loyal, sensitive, funny, and yes, very, very loving and infuriating beyond belief at times with her acting. I would, in fact, have a thoroughbred again without hesitation. That's a lovely story. Thank you very, very much for that one. And then we had some from those who are a little bit more of an overview, standing back and looking at racehorses and thoroughbreds more in the racing world. There's somebody here that said, I just wanted to put a, a few thoughts down, but in every discipline I believe there is good and bad. I have been privileged to see racehorses behind the scenes living an extreme life of luxury then it breaks my heart to see a horse lose its life, not only in racing, but on the roads, a personal experience, and in show jumping, as I was at this year's Hickstead Derby. Unfortunately, I witnessed it. Then there are also truly magical moments, the undisputed partnership between rider and horse. So I am definitely on Team Koya. And when it came to the exceptional, so, so, so many fans of Red Rum and Desert Orchid, the beautiful grey with the spring of a gazelle. And, of course, I was reminded, and rightly so, of how I neglected to mention Arkel. How could I have not mentioned Arkel? And who has not seen the beautiful painting of those three stunning horses? is actually called We Three Kings, and it was painted by a lady called Susan L. Crawford. But it's absolutely beautiful, and it depicts Arkel, Red Rum, and Desert Orchid. And who could not be moved by that image? And also, I'd have to say, who has not had a Christmas card with that picture on it at some point in their lives? And then, of course, there were other superstar names that people mentioned as well that I hadn't. Corto Star, a French-bred superstar and an absolute legend of National Hunt. And then, interestingly enough, there was another flat horse that somebody mentioned, a horse called Yates, another absolute superstar, this one an Irish superstar. Somebody wrote, I have been lucky enough to witness Yates winning as a two-year-old. I followed his career and moved mountains to make sure I could be there every year he went to Ascot for the Ascot Gold Cup. The only horse to win a true Stayers flat race four consecutive years running and at the age of eight. Such a striking presence. He was awesome in the flesh. And actually, I do know a fact about Yates. He was another horse considered a freak of nature in the sense that he, like Secretariat, actually has a physically bigger heart than is normal for horses. Now let's finish with this one. This one, in fact, was written in reference to Dennis himself, and this lady wrote, Good God, he sounds just like my husband. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. So on that note, very many thanks to everyone that wrote in. Please do 
keep your ideas and your thoughts coming. Uh, www.equinedevilsadvocate.com, the website, Podbean, of course, or Facebook. And you can also listen on Spotify. I do sometimes forget to mention Spotify. Apologies for that. Now, let's do a little recap of Dennis and the Menace. We all recognise that Dennis was a character, to say the least, and truly master of his own destiny. And so one could perhaps say disrespectful, willful, undisciplined, and all those things that make us see a slightly different horse and take a different approach, or what we considered the most productive approach, play to his strengths, encourage the best of him, have him on side, engaged and on board with his work. You see, I do think the saying is absolutely true. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink. Very true. And so it was decided that Dennis should go hunting. Yes, for racing eligibility, but also to stimulate him mentally And physically, it would be uplifting. Variety, after all, is the spice of life, to coin another phrase. And who would ride him? The trainer's response to this was, I wouldn't be seen dead, dressed up like a plonker, or words to that effect. You see, hunting is steeped in tradition. There is protocol and a strict dress code. And in fact, there were only two of us who actually owned the appropriate garments. Myself and another girl. But she didn't want to do it. So I said, yes, I'll do it. I'm not exactly entirely sure why. Now, as I mentioned, Dennis was of Irish bloodstock. And in some sense, it's reasonable to suppose that he may well have been hunting in Ireland as it is actually quite common practice over there and something they do a lot with with young horses as an educational platform. But the twist with Dennis was that actually he was brought to England unbacked. So it was in fact very unlikely that he had seen the hunting field before. Nevertheless, all appropriate arrangements were made with the hunt All the documents were signed and the location of the meet that we were going to go to was chosen. Dennis knew something was not right that particular morning. He had not been worked first string before breakfast as he usually was. Also, he had not done his pre-race prep workout that week either. He was on to us. What is going on? Something has changed. And when horses identify change, they change. His normal, cool, calm, lofty, that slightly superior attitude to life changed. He fidgeted, swished his tail, stamped his hind leg whilst I was trying to get him ready. His tongue, well, that went into absolute overdrive. He st- stuck it out more and more and more to the point at which it was actually clamped so hard between his teeth it started to go blue and oh my god Dennis your tongue is turning blue Dennis you are a menace I was actually a tad alarmed so I shoved my hand in the side of his mouth to make him open it and pulled his tongue outside and slapped it with the flat of my hand to revive it somewhat and turn blue, hopefully back to pale pink. Dennis, you are a menace. As all this was going on, the trainer came over to his stable and said, how is he? Fractious, I said. Hmm, he replied. He is too smart for his own good. You would do well to tack him up now, that being the case. Good thinking, I thought. And so I did using my own GP saddle and a crisp white saddle cloth. And the oddest thing, as soon as I entered his stable with tack, Dennis stopped being fractious and put his tongue away. 
and eyed his new wardrobe with interest. Now, hunting. Well, I freely admit, I have mixed feelings about it. Do I thoroughly enjoy the opportunity to gad about the countryside over land that is not normally allowed to be ridden on? Yes, I do. I do also like the hounds. They are big and smiley and so people-friendly. And, in fact, you may think it's all about die-hard, rugged, red-faced, hunting, gutting, fishing, shooting types. But actually, it isn't. There's housewives and children and they, they chat about baking and dinner parties and school while clattering along the lanes all three abreast. It's another community, and actually quite a close-knit one. The huntsmen are respected. It's a position valued as the guardian of the countryside and of being of great service to the community and the countryside. The whippers in, again, they're respected for their knowledge and love and care of their hounds. If you think people with a passion for horses are the only ones who can regale tales of ancestry and breeding and brilliance, well, think again. Go talk to a whipper in. But then there is also, under the umbrella of this country sport, there is the field, which is all those on horseback who are there to support, aid and assist those that lead the hunt. There are noises to be learnt, various sort of whoops and hollers to signal sightings and the location of foxes. Well, this bit... Uh, no, it's not for me. So, in the lorry, on the way to the meet, I thought of some intriguing, complex recipes to talk about, to use as a distraction if needed, and topics of engaging conversation. And if in desperation I thought, I'll just say, Oh, it went that way! The opposite direction. A lie would have to suffice, but, hey, if needs must. We arrived punctually at the meet. Lots of activity. There was horses being unloaded from lorries, people chatting. Some came trotting up the road as they had hacked to the meet or unboxed some distance away to warm up their horses. The master was there in his bright red hunting jacket with gold buttons standing in the centre of the village green on his big grey hunter. The whippers in, all dressed in forest green hunting coats with bright gold buttons. People, supporters, all welly clad, were chatting away and partaking of beverages, sausage rolls, sandwiches and roast potatoes were being handed around on huge silver trays to all. And there they could be seen supping on glasses of plum wine and whiskey. The hounds, sociable in the extreme and affectionate, milled around everyone with big smiley faces and wagging tails. I glanced up at Dennis through the lorry window. Eyes, wide as saucers they were, ears pricked and nostrils wide open, breathing in the scent of this spectacle. I think I'm going to need plum wine, I thought. Dennis's owner was also there, and he met us coming over to the lorry. We had a plan. The plan was ramp down, partition open, whip off the rug, do up the girth, pull down the stirrup on the facing side, take off head collar, out of the lorry, owner on the right side, Pull down the right stirrup, trainer on the left, quick leg up, and then it's all in the lap of the gods. And so, mounted by the swift, accurate leg up, I was aboard, and Dennis stood, beautifully square, his small, neat head high aloft, and his tail slightly raised, soaking in this sight before him. And then 
he grew. He was actually tall enough at about seventeen hands, but it was like the air suspension on a lorry. As he breathed in, he engaged his core and his whole rib cage elevated, and up came his neck. It rose from the base of his chest up. And out and forward it went, in this huge muscular arc. And I thought I definitely need wine. Let us not forget this horse is racing fit.、Hmm. And you know, it's one of those moments in one's riding when tact is of paramount importance. One needs to sit so light, so still. And yet, so connected to the centre of this power, for if you pounce on it, it can blow like a geyser. If you grab at it, it will explode right back at you. My way, a little scratch, and a pat on the side of his neck, just to bring a little bit of attention back to me, back to my voice. And just a little quiet click. Come on, Dennis, let's go get wine. And so, thank you for joining us here at Equine Devil's Advocate on this blustery, cold December Friday afternoon. And of course, do please join us again on Monday to see how this day unfolded for myself. And Dennis the Menace in the hunting field. Until then, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, take care, and we will speak soon.